Hi there, friends. How you doing? I'm delighted to have you here joining us for another TechSoup Connect British Columbia slash Western Canada event. My name's Eli. I'm one of the co-hosts along with Ben, who you'll also see here with us. Today, we're going to be talking about this idea of product management. And this workshop is going to help you create a strategy and a roadmap for your product. And we'll define what product is and how it can be used for more than just what you might think a, a product traditionally is. And then we're going to talk about how you can then implement this product methodology to improve your programs, your websites, all the things that you want to bring out into the world. Our guest presenter today is Moshe Mik, uh, Mikhanovsky, who is the founder of Products for Good. Moshe is a product management leader who started his career on the engineering side. So he's got technical chops. And he fell in love with product management after seeing the gap that exists between what customers and our, our clients really want and what we actually are producing inside our team. He really enjoys applying his lean, iterative approach to develop products that are stating users' expectations. And he does that as a product coach, as a consultant, and in this pro project he's created, which is Products for Good, a social initiative for aspiring product managers to learn their craft while building products to help humanity. If you are someone who says, I want to be a product manager, but I'm not quite sure how I get into that sector. This is the person to talk to. And with that, I'm going to get out of the way and pass you over to today's expert. Thank you so much, Eli, and thank you for the introduction. So thank you again so much. And I will do a bit more about myself, just a way of introduction and a few of the other things that I'm doing, because I'm, I do wear a lot of hats and I tend to try to love to do a lot of things. So originally I'm from Israel. This is the beautiful Tel Aviv coast. These days I live in Toronto. I've been in Canada since 2002. And before that, I also lived in the state for several years. I started as a software developer. This was the first computer that I developed on digital box. If any one of you have ever heard of that, it's hard virtually without seeing the people to know how, what generation I'm talking with, but this kind of aged me as well. Because this was quite a bit, a long time ago. For 20 years, I worked as a software developer and then on the engineering end of things, I was a city of a startup here in Toronto and did a lot of many different software development, mainly in B2B. And then I moved into product management. These are some of the organizations that I worked with and some of the clients that I had. Points International is one of the companies here in Toronto. Actually, all of these are companies in Toronto. And then those were some of the clients that I worked with internationally and, and also locally. I currently am doing a few things. So one of them that Eli mentioned was the products for good. This is that initiative I started the last year to really help aspiring product managers learn what product management is all about. And do with that, we, we build a real product. So the product we are working on is a backend search system for people, friends and family of missing persons that they need help to organize their search events and organize resources for the search event. So we're going through the full process of discovery of the problem and discovery of the solution, which is some of the things I will talk about today. I'm also teaching at Chulik. This is a business school here in New York University, and I'm doing some work with this organization called Root Quotient. This is a for-profit. So my non-for-profit is this area over here for products for good. And I have a couple of podcasts that I'm hosting focusing on product management and tools for product people. So the agenda today, and I hope I will fulfill the expectations that Eli set up in the beginning in the introduction. But first of all, I want to go through what is product management. So to really have a better understanding of what are we talking about when we talk product management, um, where does product management fit in non nonprofits? Um, usually all my career was in profit. It's only really last year that I started getting interested in nonprofits through the uh, products for good. Um, I did help uh, through consulting in 2022 to a nonprofit here in uh, Canada, but in a, but that was a very small diving into that. And, uh, and I did see a bit of how their mindset was a bit different than, than in the uh, profit organization. Then I want to go through a, a little process. What is the process for product management? 
the roles and relationship on the product team because they are the one that the product team. When we say product team, we talk about not just product people, but also the engineers and everyone that are part of making the product happen or building the product. Then a little about product market fit and what does that mean to, to be a product market fit and some takeaway at the end. First of all, let's start with what is a product management. And I'm sure you will have questions, so feel free to put them in the chat and Eli is going to monitor this and let me know. I can do either answer the questions at the end, or if you want to stop me through this and just ask the question, I'm okay either way. It's just that I don't see you, so I still hope you're there. <laughs> okay. So what is product management? So the first thing about product management is finding value to users. We want to create a value to the users. And in order to create value, we have to understand what are the things that will be valuable to them. The users are in the central of things, of all things for us. And we need to really make sure that we are creating value. If we are creating value, they will use the product. If we don't, they will, don't, they will not use it. As simple as that. In order to do that, we want, we need to find the right problem to solve. Many times we have, we think that a problem is a problem because we face that problem or we see some people facing the problem, but when we come to solve it, people were like indifferent about our solution or they're indifferent about even changing the way they're, they are doing things today. Finding the right problem is, is a work by itself, uh, because we don't, we shouldn't really make assumption that everything that we are thinking is a problem is really uh, a real problem. Um, now on the other side of things, there is also our viability. Now, sometimes here you will see, I'm talking about, um, the company, the word company, sometimes organization do whether it is a company or organization in a nonprofit, we might call it something else. It, it's really it's all at, at the end of the day, it's all the same thing. Viability here, maybe there is no profit that we're looking for. Maybe there is no ROI, like in profit organizations. But in general, when something viable to an organization, it means we can actually support it with the resources that we have. We can support a specific product. So if the users are using it and they have problems, they can come to us and we can help them. We can legally do what we're legally doing. So things like that, it's what viability really means here in this context. Then it's about managing the product itself from ideation through discovery, development, delivery, go to market monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes all the way up to some settings. So some products will have their cycle, life cycle of maybe several versions, several iterations, and maybe after a few years, we decide, you know what, we cannot support this product anymore. So we sunset the product, maybe we'll replace it with another product. I will talk more about the, the process later on in, in a later section. If you are coming from product development environments, you might hear about Scrum, you might hear about agility. There is this notion of a product owner in some places where there is a role product owner. And this is really coming from Scrum, which is a methodology to do software development in a agile way, but it's really only part of that. And there are some mis misconception in the, um, industry that product owner is, um, another job that is separate from the product management, et cetera, but it's really part of what this is all about. If you're not familiar with all those terms, it's not that important to, to, oops, what did I just do? Okay. It's not that important actually. Did I stop my share screen? Yeah. Screen sharing has ended. Sorry yeah. about that. And you're back. Okay. I'm back. I was clicking on the wrong thing here. Okay. Here we go. That was what product management is. What it is not project management. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Many people that don't understand product management, they think that it is equal to project management, but it's not. And I have a slide after this one to explain some of the differences over there. There is also this term that some known coined some years ago saying that product managers are the CEO of the product and see if they can make all the decisions about the product. That's also is incorrect. We don't make all the decisions about the product. So we. Try to stay away from that statement. Um, it's not just about the strategy. Product management is about strategy and it's also about execution. So some people think product management is only strategy, but it's actually going throughout the entire process. Like I mentioned before, it's not just about product ownership and it's also not just about marketing. So there, there are some positions out there of people doing product marketing management specifically, 
this is more out face, face it outwards to the organization, to how do we sell it, what the competition is, et cetera. But there is a lot of internal work that needs to be done also in product management. So this is a slide I was talking about comparing project management to product management. There are several differences over there, but the tool that I wanted to highlight it is this one, project duration versus product life cycle. A project has a duration. It is a one-time endeavor. You have a start, you have an end. Usually it will, the planning for it will be something like that, like a gun chart. And every project will have its own start and end. And that's it really. A product I usually might have a start. We never know if it will have an end. Many products that we know do have an end, but many products that we know do not. One example is the iPhone. The iPhone is a product that started, I don't know when it was the first year that they started the iPhone. Is it 10 years, 15 years? I can't even remember now. But every version of an iPhone that is being released is still, is still the same product. It, it's an iPhone. It's a new version of the product. There is new enhancements of that product. But the product line is still the same one, and they continue to release a new version of that. Um, Microsoft Word is another one. I, I've been using Microsoft Word probably for 30 years now. Um, it's still Microsoft Word, but it has changed from the day one to what it is right now many times. So really to create all of those versions, you will have a project, but the product itself, it's still the same product because it's still trying to solve the same problem. It's still trying to get um, to the same uh, uh, personas of people that are using it, the, the value that they're creating for those users and to create some uh, um, value or be viable to the organization that is creating that. Um, another big difference that I wanted to highlight is the outputs versus outcomes, where a, pr a project has outputs, so we know these are the deliverables that we're going to have. A product, uh, usually what we're looking for is not the outputs, it's not the features that we develop or not the components, but it's the outcomes. What does the product create for the users? So when we define the success of a project, we define the success by saying, did we create those outputs in the given time by the given resources with the given budget that was given for this project? And if we check all of these, we're saying, yes, this is a, this is a, this is a success. But if no one is using the outputs, so let's say we created a product during a specific project and no one is using those, then what's the point? We just wasted a lot of time and money. But if we are creating an outcome and the outcome was we need to have a thousand users using successfully this product for in the next, in the first five months of going live, and they need to have X, Y, and Z value in there, then it could be that one release, one project will be enough for this, but we might need several projects to iterate on the product until we get to that specific outcome. So with the product, we usually like to, to talk about outcomes. Okay. So here I'm talking about uh, the... Sorry, this might be a good time to address some of the initial questions that are coming in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got a first question coming in from Mater Clark, who says, what kinds of work in and with and for any one of more nonprofits is necessary before the product manager launches and starts a soon to be successful consulting firm? That's, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. But what I'm, I think I understand is that if a person work in a non-profit, like when are they ready to launch their own business, their I own consulting? I think that's how I'm reading that as well. And Maynard, if you want to offer any clarifications in the chat, of course, that'd be lovely. And while we're waiting for any of those clarifications, let's maybe I'll just the next question here from Rosalind, who's saying, mm -hmm. can you clarify the release management versus product strategy? Is the product release just a subset component of a product strategy? Okay. Yeah. So let me first maybe answer Maynard because he did roll it right over there. And that's correct. It seems that I've done that. Yeah, I'm, I can tell you, Maynard, that I'm still trying to do that. I'm, yes, I started my consulting business last year, mainly because I got kicked in the bat for, yeah, not for, but being laid off the fourth time in my career, unfortunately. And I had to do something about it. So I've been developing software and building products for over 30 years. And I felt that I had enough experience to start consulting and helping other organizations. What you have to do 
to get there. It not, I'm still struggling with that uh, sometimes, but we uh, definitely can talk about this. Maybe it's a whole discussion that we can have. So feel free to connect with me. I will have uh, my uh, LinkedIn at the end. So uh, I'll be happy to talk about that. And then, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And then uh, Rosaline, release management versus product strategy. Yes. Release management is more about the tactical work of the way I understand it, at least. And I hope you are sharing to the same thing that I do. So the release management is the tactical decisions of which features we're going to release when, how we're going to release them, who is going to use them. Sometimes we will do like alpha, beta and, and, and other expand it to others. Sometimes we will do specific features for specific segmentations, maybe with uh, feature flags or things like that. And product strategy is really at the beginning. I will talk a bit about, about that in one of the slides later. Uh, it's a bit about the, the, the beginning stage of how do I get to my company vision, to my organizational vision through the product vision and the product strategy will support that product vision. So a product by itself has to have a vision as well. Where are we want to be? Where does this product needs to want to be in like five years from now? How do we see it in the future? And how do we get there? So the product strategy might lead eventually your release management to say, okay, now that I, I have a specific strategy, I can define areas of the product that needs to be built first versus things need to be built later. And then that will also help me with that release management. And maybe what you're referring to the release management is, is a bit also about prioritization there. What do you prioritize first and, and, and stuff like that, right? Thank you, Eli, for sharing my LinkedIn. And please do mention that you came from the tech soup because I do get invitations from different places. I hope this, this answered the question, Rosalie. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Jobs to be done. Here I'm mentioning a few of those jobs to be done for a product manager, and there is a lot of them. Discover the right problem to solve, understand the context of the product, like what the industry we're in, what is the competition out there, what is our organizational strategy. So there is a lot of context that we need to learn and understand. Strategize and align it. I mentioned it before in my answer. Choose and prioritize what needs to be built and when do we need to build it based on the strategy align all the stakeholders and there is a lot of stakeholders sometimes depends on the organization, but you, you really want to have alignment because every stakeholder will have their, their the view and the things that they important to them. Other jobs to be done, enable the delivery team to build the right solution. So it's not just working about the strategy and working with stakeholders, but it's also working with the team that will deliver that, the developers, the designers, the QA, whoever it is to build the right thing. Make sure that the solution that they, they actually develop is viable for the organization. So if you need to be, to enable things to you know, get customer support calls or compliance with specific uh, uh, regulations, whatever it is, enable the organization to go to market. And this enablement is not so much about what the strategy to go to market, but it's more about um, when we need to sell it, how do we sell it? Do the salespeople know how to do it? In, in nonprofit, maybe there is no sales portion over there, but it's education uh, materials to the market or which are going to, how do we tell the people that are going out to, to tell people about it? How do we educate them about their product, et cetera? Know how the product performs. So be able to monitor so we can actually improve it. And then know what the user do with the product, uh, what works and what doesn't, again, so we can improve it. So there is a lot of things that product managers need to, be do, to do. Now. In the product management for nonprofit, what I wanted to do here is to say, okay, so how does product management relevant to nonprofit? It's probably clear, or at least to me, because I always worked in, in for-profit and especially in software companies building software that we build the software to make money, right? We want to sell it to as many people and to make as much money as we can. So how is it relevant to nonprofit? So here I, I divide it to three product service and digital transformation. So if we're looking at the product, some nonprofit organizations do develop products as part of their service. So an example over here is like kind of the helps or kind of the gives their platform is a platform they develop themselves and they license that platform like uh, any other SaaS product. And they're still non-pro nonprofit organizations, but they're the main thing that they do is develop this platform and still enable it to their clients. Products for Good is another, although we are not yet incorporated, I'm planning this year to, to create a non-for-profit for Products for Good. 
So actually any tips for any one of you will be helpful. So if you have tips for me, that would be great because I'm debating what structure to create it. But in general, we, we, are, we are trying to build product and those products will be used by people, right? Uh, the second one is a service. So most nonprofits, at least that I know, are providing some type of a service, whether it is fundraising for whatever it is, whether it is for the environment, educational services, child services, whatever it is, right? And the, usually when you provide a service, it's not as scalable as a product, mainly because there is a lot of human interaction and there is some workflow and that this workflow could be complex. But if you adopt a product mindset, then, and you can say my, my service over here is like a product, or there are some aspects of the service that I can think about here with product mindset, it can help us build the right service. I actually, since I, I started doing product management, almost everything in my life, I think about, okay, so how do I treat it as a product? My job progression is, is a product as well. My projects that I do at home, these are projects. My kids' education, to me, it's a product. So there is a lot of things that you can think about. Okay, what are the aspects that from product management that can be helpful here? We talked about finding the right problem. You need to find the right problem also to create the right service. And then finding the right solution, you need to build some type of a solution for your service that will be viable for your organization so you can still support it. So do you have the right people to do it? Are there any legislations that you have to follow? So a lot of things that come in from product management still apply with service as well. And then last is digital transformations. Every organization these days, and Texel is especially built for that, that we need some technology to run our nonprofit. So we, we have some products, we might build some, some products for unique needs. So some organizations uh, will build uh, specific products to run their own business. I'm not just talking about the website that they run on, but it could be uh, for whatever reasons, many different things that, that they develop to, to run their business on or we buy a product that meets our needs. And even with the product that we buy, we need to choose the best ones. So sometimes just understanding the problems that we're trying to solve is, is a part way of which product we're going to use that really fits our need. Many times we'll need to configure those products or customize them to fit our needs. And we also need to fit everything into this system of our digital stack. So if we have a lot of different products and they all have to talk with each other, the ecosystem on its own becomes like one big product that has to work for all of our needs. Again, product management could take a role in each one of those initiatives. Okay. So next um, I'm, I want to talk quickly about product management process, the process itself. So I, I talked about a few bits before, but in the next few slides, I will go on each one of them, I'll try to do it quickly because there is a lot to cover over here. But this is a process I usually see it, that you start with some ideations, you have ideas, you make a discovery or you discover, you do activities to discover what is the right problem, what is the right solution for that. Then you strategize. So you create a strategy to say all of those things that I, that are coming in the pipeline, do they fit into our strategy, the company, the organization strategy, the product vision and product strategy. And then based on that, you define your priorities. So what is, what of these things that are coming in, in here are higher priority than other things to do. You develop based on those priorities, then you launch it to the market. You, you first launch it usually internally, then to the market, that's your go-to market. And then you start monitoring things and you have to monitor it to get information and understand how people are using it, what they use, what they don't use, and go back to ideate and the, the cycles continue like that. So if we're looking about each one of them, there is a quick uh, review over here. What is each one of them and what is the product manager or product management role in each one of them? So for example, ideas, they can come from everywhere, right? They can come from leadership, from the users, internal competition, wherever it is, right? Um, the product manager is what they need, usually need to do to, is first of all, organize. So everything is one place. Um, and I'm not talking here about how to organize it or which tool to use. Because there are many tools and you could do it as simple as some spreadsheets or it's more complex in some uh, specific tools that help you do that. But one of the most important thing when you organize it is the why, because we really want to understand why someone suggested something. 
And we want them to really say why, why they suggested it. So not just tell me the idea, but tell me why do you have that? And it's a good practice also to capture the person that gave, created the idea. Only because many times you will have this list of ideas and then later on you'll come to them and they're like, who's, who put this in here? Why, what did they want it? Why did they put any information? So you really want to have it, it, as much, more information as possible. Next year, you want to discover and discovery is really divided between problem discovery and solution discovery. And there are many different methods to do discovery, but some of them is about the, the research in the industry and the competition finding where the users are, user interviews, usability testing. There is a lot of ways to do discovery. We really, we have very short time here, so I can't go through, uh, this is a, could be a discussion on its own. How do we discover? What do we do? But many things could be like surveys, interviews, observing what people do, creating uh, user journeys with the users to, uh, to understand how they do things, creating some mockups and, and getting users to give you feedback on the, on the mockups, not just on, on whether they understand what it is and they can use it, but also whether they actually will use it. Do they see value in that? Right? So the product managers over here will be very embedded into the research, understanding the jobs to be done of those users, understanding the problems and define the user personas. This is just big highlights of things, but there are of course, more things that product managers will do here. And they, many times they will collaborate with other people, but it's important for them to do it directly with users. There is a very deep understanding uh, of, of what users need here. Strategy, as I said before, it's all aligned with the organization vision and strategy. So usually every organization will have, or should have some vision about what is their mandate? What are they trying to do? Where, why are they here for? And then some strategy on how they're going to get that place. Getting the funds for something is just one thing, but how do we get money? Whether it is we're raising funds, we're getting grants, or we have investments, or we sell something very expensive and we get people to pay for it. But there is many other strategies that we, we have to, to think about. And then for the products, and especially if you have multiple products, then you will have multiple product visions. Uh, if you have only one product for one organization, sometimes they, they tend to overlap, but uh, over time, you know, organizations will have multiple products and therefore each one of them will have its own vision and then its own strategy. And the product manager really is, they have to define this product vision and product strategy and define what does the success looks like. So what will be KPIs that we can measure those, the, those strategies and what are OKRs. If you're not familiar with OKRs is basically, um, objectives and key results. So it's a way to define what are my objectives and what would be a key result for a successful that. Prioritize, there are many methods to prioritization. Again, that could be a whole other discussion about that. How do we prioritize? The most important thing is that it should be really aligned with the, the strategy. So once we have a strategy, it's easier to define what is it that we, how can we prioritize? And then we want to make sure that we also align it with the stakeholders. So everyone understand why do we do things in a specific order that we do them. You do lead prioritization exercises. So we actually have to prioritize all the time when new things are coming in, they're not, they may not could, they may not be able to wait until someone is other things are done, but some things have higher priority than other things, critical bugs or critical issues, whatever it is. So there is always these ongoing prioritizations that happen. Product managers do make hard decisions. So one of the first word that product managers are being taught is to say no. And I've seen many t-shirts. I should get one as well with the big no on it, <laughs> but it's not an easy thing to do sometimes. Communicate to other, to, to everyone is another thing product managers do is to make sure what everyone is aligned. Negotiate. Sometimes there is a lot of negotiation that needs to happen when we prioritize. Now development, this is really dep depends if you are developing an actual software or you develop on developer something thing. This uh, slide is a bit more geared toward development of software, but it could be also for other things. Um, usually when you start the development, you will work with a bit engineer and designer to define wireframes or low fidelity designs to see how people will interact with the software. So the usability, and then with the engineer, the feasibility, can they build it? And then with the rest of the team, 
they will develop the entire thing from what we call definition of ready to the definition of done. These are again coming from uh, um, agile development. You don't have to worry about it right now so much, but in general, the product manager will collaborate with them throughout their development to tell them, basically write with them epics and stories on what needs to be developed, prioritize the functionality, communicate with the team, negotiate if they need, review and accept the work that they do because the product manager is in the position to know the best what actually is going to work for the problems they're trying to solve to the users. When they launch, there is work that needs to be done with other stakeholders like marketing, customer support, etc. And there should be some project to launch. But as I said before, project management is not project, ma product management is not project management. So we're trying to get the product management not to be the project manager on that even though in, in many organizations, they make them uh, the project managers. But there is a lot of work here to be done to create some educational material, train the trainers, support all the departments, whatever needs to be done to get ready for the launch. And then the last but not least is monitoring. We need to collect uh, data, otherwise we'll be blind and we'll not know if people are using anything. So qualitative and quantitative data, these are two types of data that we can get. We should really instrument the product and build it into the product. And then we should be able to reach out to users and talk with them. So here we need to assess the performance of the product, measure our KPIs that we defined originally and see, do we, are we able to actually, are we getting to where we need to get? Are we successful or not? Are we getting to the outcome that we defined? It's finding ongoing user feedback. So there are tools to do it through the product where you can actually uh, request um, users to give you feedback and stuff like that. Communicate it up and down throughout the organization. And then go back all the way to ideate with new ideas based on the insights that you, have, that you got from the data. So that was the process in very high level. Um, the next uh, section here I wanted to talk a bit is the roles and ownership on the product team. So we are, we like to say there are a triad that build the product team, which is a triad of someone from engineering, someone from design and someone from product management. And then there are four risks that they need to reduce. And the four risks, and that's again, one of the things that is different between project management and product. In project management, you have to reduce the time, resources, and the budget. Here, you need to reduce when you build a product, these four risks. The first one is feasibility. Can we build it? And this is the one engineering are responsible for because they are the one expert in that. They know how to build things. They are, should be familiar with new technologies or do research on new technologies and proof of concepts of new technologies. And then be able to tell us, yes, we can build it or no, we cannot build it. The other risk we can do is usability. Can the user actually understand it and use it? And this is something that user experience and user uh, interface designers, they are in the position to do that because they are the expert on, on how people are using products, whether it is the, the flow of the, the user, the data flow of the, in the data, the, the, the text, the copy that we're using in the product to get them to understand everything usability. Then we have the value and we talked about value to the users. So is there value to the clients? And is this something that product are responsible for? And viability, also we talked about that. Can our organization support it and sustain itself? Is it legal to do? Is it ethically ethical to do? Is it uh, sustainable, et cetera? And then the team itself, we talked a, li a little about that before, but usually we will have an engineer, a designer, and a product as the core of this triad. But we many times will have additional people. So usually it will not be just engineer. There will be like additional, like architect and uh, more engineers, a QA, maybe a DevOps person. And on the UI side and the product side, we might have user researchers, a business analyst, a data analyst. So this can grow into actually many positions rather than one. Now, stakeholder wise, we, this is mostly coming from for profit, but I think in non Nonprofit, there is a lot of these as well. If you have an IT department, then you will need all of these different roles in there. You definitely will have the user clients and competition on this side. And then maybe some of these might not be relevant, but many of these will still be relevant in nonprofits where you have your executive directors, you will have maybe a marketing, customer support, legal finance and HR. So each one of them might have different perspective about what do they need from the products to do. And they, they, not, they may not always gel with each other or they may not agree with each other. Some of them might be for long-term requirements, some of them will be for short-term requirements. And really 
the product uh, person job here is to align everyone with, that's what I said before about communicating between everyone and aligning everyone. It's really with all of those stakeholders. Okay. And the question that I usually put here is who is, who wears the product manager hat at your nonprofit or at your, your organization? Because that's really the question that with all of those uh, things that needs to be done and the responsibility is in the process for the product person, if there is no product person, so who is taking care of that? Is it one of you? Is it a, design, a designer? Is it a, de a developer? Is it maybe someone in the executive team? Or maybe there is a product manager, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done over there by a product person and, and, and someone needs to do it, even if they don't know that they're doing this. Now, what, what is product market fit? Product market fit is, is a bit fuzzy thing, actually. There is no one definition or one formula that can say, okay, if you have this, then you have a product market fit. This diagram is from Dan, Dan Olson. He wrote this book, the Lean Product Playbook. He, this is from his book and he is basing a lot of the, the stuff he wrote in his book on that. It's a really good book. I really recommend it. If anyone is interested in product management to read that book. But basically he is talking about on the market side, you have the target customers and your, and their undeserved needs. So if you know who the customer market, the target customers are, they have some jobs to be done. They have some problems. And they probably have some solutions for these problems, but those solutions are not meeting their need. So that's why they're called undeserved needs. So the first thing is really to identify those target customers, the problems that they have, and why are they undeserved. And then if you build a product, let's say you build this product over here, it will create some value proposition. It will have some feature sets and a UX for the, them to use it. Now the question is there a fit between what you're building over here to this. So if there is, if this one over here is shifted to the left or shifted to the right, then it doesn't fit exactly that target customer and their undeserved need. And in his uh, book, he's talking about how you can try to build that, but it's a whole process. So it's hard to go over in one session. Another, not really the finishing, but another interesting diagram I've seen is from Kenny, I forget his last name, but he has this very known podcast and blog about product management. And he basically put this diagram saying, either you, you've made a product that people want, or you can make some profits from it. So in the nonprofit organization, we probably have to change that a bit to say, what does that mean? He's talking mostly to profit. That's most of the world they're talking about for profit, unfortunately. But here it could be maybe not make a profit, achieving your goals or whatever that is. And then you can also find and keep people sustainably. So that means there is a continuing need for that product. So it's not just a one-time thing that you deliver it to one set of people and then that's it. You cannot find any more people or uh, to use it. And also you cannot keep those that, that started using it. And then if there is a balance with this, the, the, between these three, then you can, you found a product, product market fit. Meaning that if you, this is a very small you know, or it's not really balanced with the others, there is no product market fit yet there. This is another quote I found from this guy called Egan Montalbury. And he's talking about, and I highlighted over here a bit what he's talking about, basically saying in the early stage, before you have product market fit, as a founder, you push your product to the market. So you have to tell everyone about it and you have to do, there is a lot of efforts to people actually get to start using it, et cetera. Then at some point, the best companies achieve product market fit which is characterized by pull from the market. So this can uh, manifest in customers start to demand it. They come to you, they tell their friends about it. Again, what, what you're seeing from uh, all of those examples is that it's not a, a very strict definition. Now we know that we got the product market fit, uh, but it's more of a feeling and some of it is a feeling. One of the main things to, to maybe look at is retention. So if we have a retention, Usually people will start using our product or service, whatever it is. If they, some of them will fall off and not everyone will continue using it. If everyone fall off eventually, then we definitely don't have a product market fit. But if eventually there is a percentage of user, and this is just an example, this is not, everyone needs to be like that. There could be many ways that this graph is drawn. But if we have some sustainable people that are ret we retain that will continue using our 
product or service or whatever it is, then we have some type of product market fit. So that's one of the ways we can actually try to measure that. So what I wanted to do to conclude today is some takeaway based on everything that we said. So the first thing is, if you want to take away from all of this discussion in the nonprofit as in what to look for product in product management, because there is a lot there, as you saw, is we need to discover the right problems to solve. If we are thinking we are solving the right problem, but which we don't have any evidence from that from real users, then we might not um, solve it the right thing. We might build something that no one is going to use and uh, et cetera. So one of the way that I usually do over here is I create some type of hypothesis. So things that I think I know, but I'm not sure about, I will define an hypothesis. And then I will try to define how do I test this hypothesis? How do I go to the market, find the right users and see if my hypothesis was correct? There are different ways to, through those discovery methods to, to discover whether they collect data about this specific policy to make sure I'm solving the right problem. Then I want to test ideas for solution before spending too much on building something no one can use. As a rule of thumbs, try to build something uh, that will be, will be used. And before you build it, you really want to test it, find ways to do your testing. And if, and this should go directly in your, into your roadmap that your roadmap will say, this is the the outcome that we want to try to do. And therefore we're going to test this hypothesis or we're going to test this solution. And only then once we get the correct um, data for it to say, yes, this will work or this will not work, we can continue and spending more time on building. Oops, I did it again. Sorry about that. There we go. Next, keep iterating. So don't develop the first version and say, okay, we're done because we're not. Usually there will be many iterations to, to find the right value and to continue keeping creating value. Start with a vision and strategy to identify what's most important. That's really important to, to, like we mentioned throughout the process, without the vision and your strategy, it's really hard to prioritize on anything that will go into the roadmap. Prioritize what to do based on the vision and, and strategy, and then identify outcomes to achieve rather than outputs. Based on your strategy, you define what is successful, what the success means to us, how do we measure the success, and then this will be the outcomes that you want to, to build for. If you're trying to build just for outputs, then you might release 10 new features. If no one is using them, then what's the point? But if you, you're saying, what I'm measuring is this specific outcome, success in A, B, and C, and then the 10 features you are developing, feature A and B, are, one and two are related to success criteria A, and you can measure it because you know how to collect the data and how to find information about that. That's, that's a real achievement there. And then use the outcomes to create a roadmap, like I said. Okay. Thank you so much. This is, I think we, I, we, I left a few minutes for, I, I was supposed to leave a few more minutes, but I tend to talk a lot. So I hope that wasn't too much. But I got for you my LinkedIn and a few other links in, in the link tree and also my coaching page and the podcast. And I didn't mention at the beginning, but I even wrote a book, which I treated as a product as well, even though it was a um, fictional book, so unrelated to product management or technology at all. But if you're interested, you, you can always go and check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us that good overview of what is product management and how we can bring it into our organizations. Here's a really practical question actually coming in from Steven who asked, who says, I'm, the di I'm on a digital team within a larger not-for-profit. And so our products are systems that they've deployed within the organization rather than going up and creating their own software from scratch. So it's coming in from external vendors. And so they're using that to support data management, the organization, communications, and all these other functions within the org. And so they're not developing that platform, but they're configuring and setting systems up for use. And so he's really asking, like, how do we apply this model of the product management to these systems that, that, that you don't necessarily have created from scratch, but are core to the, the function of your organization? Yeah. And especially if you use them for many years, it's, our world is changing all the time. Like neural technologies are evolving. 
new needs are coming up, like after COVID and before COVID, we hear that all the time. You probably do see over time whether the existing systems that you have are still supporting the needs that you have or your changing needs. And that's where you you want to, first of all, identify, do you do they still fit what you are trying to do or do you have any gaps in them? And those gaps are specific problems. The users here are, you're the users and all the different people in the organizations that are using, they're the clients, they're the users. And then you, you identify, okay, so now are we, can we sustain what we're doing going forward with the systems that we have? Or are we going to be blocked by scaling up or going into the, the, the next decade, whatever it is, because of some limitations of those systems. And, and then identify, okay, if we do have gaps, what are the priorities of those gaps? How does it match with our strategy as an organization to whatever the strategy is to grow in the future, to be, to provide more service to other people, to utilize more AI? I don't know what it is, but there could be different strategies there. Based on that, you prioritize and okay, maybe there are some gaps in there that you want to, to fix. And then can you fix with the existing products because they have ways to expand, they have additional plugins, they have ways to customize or whatever it is, or do you need to develop something new or do we need to replace them altogether? Each one of those decisions is a very big decision because when you have these technologies already, it might be very expensive to change them. But if you can foresee that in 10 years, all of this will be obsolete and it will cost you a lot to maintain and the hardware for them or maintenance for them, whatever it is, you might need to put a plan in place to, to do something about it. Does that answer the question? I have got one more question coming in as we come towards the end here from Rosalind, okay. who says, like, how does this process integrate into agile methodology or human-centered design? Where is there like mm. overlap and where is there like a point of distinction? Yeah. There is definitely a lot of uh, overlap there. The thing is when you were saying agile methodology, when we're thinking agile methodology, it depends what are we thinking about. Many people think about agile or agility only from the perspective of the delivery, not from the perspective of the discovery. And I've been in organizations that agility was only about the delivery, but we were told what to do. So. Uh, our executives told us, do this, do that. And we're basically just what we call feature factories. So the, we worked with a scrum and we claimed we were agile, but we are not very agile. So agility is really a mindset for the entire organization and for the entire life cycle of the product, including the discovery from the problem and, and ideation. And, and that's, what, that's why you do feel this uh, overlap, but it's more than an overlap because it really depends what you're looking at. Human-centered design is also, there is a lot in there that, that is part of that. We work with designers and we want them to make sure that the application is, or whatever the product we develop or the services that we build are very easy for the users to use. They're understood. Uh, this is that usability I was talking about. And that's where really human-centered design is coming from. I had to develop software in the past that I didn't have designers. So I had to learn it on my own and did it on my own. Then I, I was more lucky in other places to have them designers, but it's always, it's a good skill to have also, and no matter what you do, these are uh, good overlapping skills, either as a mindset or as skills that could be very helpful for anyone, really, if you're a developer, if you, whatever you do, to know at least about them and try to approach to things in that way. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. We're really grateful for your time here. 